So here's our second video uh, regarding the first apocalypse of James, and in this particular video we are going to address the historical questions about the text. In the last one we talked about the uh, content, and now we're going to talk about the secondary scholarship about it. So let's look at the historiography here. So uh, just to review a little bit, the first apocalypse of James is a lesser known Gnostic revelation. So uh, apocalypse and revelation mean r roughly the same thing because the, uh, the Greek term that informs the English word apocalypse pretty, just mean, pretty much just means the unveiling or the revealing of something. And uh, uh, this revelation describes Jesus' secret teachings to the apostle James. And according to the text, these teachings are then preserved by the Apostle Adai. And we'll talk about Adai a little bit more in a second. Um, but uh, you might wonder why these particular apostles are used as important characters in this text. And uh, the reason is the usual one in early Christian literature. And uh, the idea is that the associations with these apostles would lend some type of authority to the text. So in other words, probably these two apostles are important people in the communities of Christians that are producing these texts, and so using them as characters in the texts would lend authority to the text that is uh, you know, being, uh, being written. So as you can see also on the side, we have a little icon of uh, the Apostle James here. He's holding a book. He looks very scholarly and very stoic. So let's see what we have uh, for the next slide here. So if you may remember from the last uh, video, there are about three themes to the text. Okay, so the whole text is framed as a conversation between Jesus and James. It's a secret conversation. Other people don't get to listen to it. Only James gets to listen to it. And then later, uh, Adai writes this, uh, writes this secret revelation down. So Jesus explains how it is that you ascend through the 72 heavens. And this has to do with the cosmology of the text. The text assumes that there are 72 heavens, and the believer has to find a way to get through all 72 to the highest level of the cosmos and to, uh, in order to be with God Most High. Okay, So uh, after this explanation of the cosmology, Jesus goes on to say that James must suffer like Jesus. This is bad news to James because this means that he's going to uh, suffer a horrible death and a martyrdom. And we know from our uh, you know, historical records that uh, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, uh, did indeed suffer this death. But if this James uh, refers to uh, James, the uh, son of Zebedee, then it's not clear historically you know, what exactly happened to him. But in this text, it's, a, it's an explanation of what will happen to, to uh, James. So uh, then the final thing uh, that Jesus talks about with James is how the secret will be kept safe for future believers. In other words, it's an explanation of why some of the secrets within this text are given to some believers, whereas other people don't get to receive it at all. Okay, so like I said, I've done a video on the topic all, uh, regarding the content already, so you can go and find that uh, on my channel. Um, but this particular presentation focuses on three um, subjects. We're going to talk about the manuscript tradition of the text. We're going to talk about the provenance, which just means it's like the famous, uh, it's like the, uh, the archaeological word for where does it come from. And then we're going to talk about the scholarly debates among historians. So those are the three things that we're going to focus on. So let's go to the existing copies. Uh, we're very fortunate. Uh, because we have three existing copies of this text. Sometimes we don't get quite this many, so it's a little bit of a treat that we have three as opposed to just one or zero, which is what we would have from pretty much everything else. So the oldest copy would be from the third century Codex Chacos, and many of you may recognize this Codex Chacos as the same book that also contained the infamous Gospel of Judas. But lots of people don't know that the codex that has the Gospel of Judas in it also has these other texts in it, like the uh, first apocalypse of James. But that's just because the Gospel of Judas is so famous that it overshadows some of these other texts. But if you were to look at the codex overall, you would find, you would find these present in it. Um, and you can access the critical edition of the first apocalypse of James by going to this particular book here, this was a very early uh, uh, production that, that came out when the uh, Gospel of Judas was made available to the general public. 
um, these uh, scholars, particularly Kasser and Verst, came in and they uh, made a transcription and a translation of all of the texts that are in the uh, Codex. So if you're wanting to look at the first Apocalypse of James in addition to the Gospel of Judas, I would recommend getting this book uh, to look at it. And uh, as you can see, it was published in 2007, and I commend it to you. So the next copy that we have is actually from another famous corpus of texts, and that would be the Nag Hammadi Library. Specifically, it is from Codex 5, in other, word, in other words, the fifth bound book within the uh, collection of Gnostic writings. Uh, it's well understood among scholars that this collection probably comes from the 4th century, and uh, it is a very accessible corpus of texts because there are digital, uh, digital images of them uh, online. Specifically, uh, they're from the Claremont Graduate University website. I actually have a very dear friend who's uh, getting her PhD there right now, and um, so uh, she'll have a very easy access to these sorts of things. But the important thing to realize is that anybody can go to the uh, Claremont website and look at the copies that they have. Um, and I would recommend that to you if you happen to know some Coptic and you would like to see some of those uh, documents. And uh, as you can imagine, there are also critical editions in English and, uh, uh, and in Coptic. Or should I say there are critical editions in Coptic and then English translations of the editions. And they're accessible both online and in print. And as you can see, I made a capitalization error here. I should have capitalized the C, but in fact I did not, so sorry about that. So here's the thing that's more exciting to me, and so the, the, the newest copy, um, in other words, the, the one that's most recent in the manuscript tradition, is a Greek version of the text from the 4th or 5th century. Okay, So this would have been copied down probably just after the Nag Hammadi codices. Um, so, in other words, this would be the, the latest one to be written compared to Nag Hammadi, um, but uh, it's very valuable because it is written in Greek, and it's very likely that that is the language in which it was originally written. The Coptic language usually has, has just copies of originals, but the originals are lost, but scholars tend to guess that the originals of lots of these early Christian documents were written in Greek. And uh, so in the, the correct order of things would be that we have the Codex Chacos first in about the 3rd century, which includes the Apocalypse of James. Then we have the Nag Hammadi Library, which includes a Coptic version. And then we have this other Greek version that comes from the 4th or 5th century. So we can compare the Coptic and Greek versions together to try to put together a complete text and try to figure out what the earliest version of it was. So uh, you can see from this picture here that part of the uh, fragment is pictured. You can see that this is the uh, the Greek version. This is from the newest uh, the newest discovery, and you can see the Greek words. For example, you can see "leges," which means "you say" in Greek over here, and some other words. But uh, I haven't sat down and tried to look at each Greek word mainly because I I don't study this text. But I thought it might be interesting uh, to include this picture in case you are interested in. Uh, transcribing it for yourself or seeing uh, what it is that we're actually looking at. Um, but again, we see that there are some issues, there are some holes in the text, and that's pretty normal for ancient manuscripts, and then they don't tend to separate between words, because uh, paper was worth a lot of money back then, and papyrus was worth a lot of money, uh, so they had to use up as much space as they could. Of course, that particular narrative doesn't really explain to me why there's so much space left up over here. It might be just aesthetic reasons that they didn't, you know, chew up all the space here. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the deal is there. Uh, but anyway, let's move on to the, the date and the provenance. So I have this map here of the ancient Roman world. Okay, and the area shaded here is what's called Syria. All right. And Syria is the hypothetical origin for lots of the uh, early Christian texts that we uh, study or cover on this uh, channel. So based on the evidence, scholars tend to identify er, uh, eastern Syria as the location in which the first Apocalypse of James was written. Okay, But you might be asking, okay, well, why do historians think this? And there's actually a pretty interesting reason. So one important reason is that the character Adai is mentioned in the text. In fact, it is Adai who is the person who supposedly writes down the text after 
Jesus imparts the words to uh, James. So Jesus gives James the words of the text, and then Adai is the one who writes them down. And this is a 10th century picture of him. Now, why is this important? Well, the Armenian church that exists even today tends to link itself to Adai, who is the reputed founder of Christianity in Edessa. This is uh, like uh, in the very southern part of uh, Armenia, or a little bit south of where Armenia is today. And that location is in eastern Syria. Okay, So these churches are part of the wider movement of Syrian and Syriac Christianity. So the fact that Adai is mentioned in this text points to an origin over there, because he is an important apostle for that area, and he's not as important elsewhere. And again, I guess I have another little typo there, so I guess uh, I hope that you will forgive me for that. Um, but anyway, so here's another important point, which is what is the date of the text? So if the text was written in eastern Syria, then when was it written? So historians tend to think that it's a late 2nd or early 3rd century text. Okay, But we can't establish the date for certainty because, again, we don't have lots of documentation for the period. Remember, we only have three copies, one from the 3rd century, one from the 4th century, and one from the 4th or 5th century. Okay, But since we have documents from that time, a 3rd century document, we know it could not have been written after the 3rd century. So I tend to favor maybe the second century date, the late second century date, um, but it could have been, you know, third century as well if it were composed very close to the time in which the Chaco's copy was written. Um, we can't disprove or prove that, um, but that is just the, the evidence that we have. Um, so anyway, here are the sources for the, the work that we have done, and um, I appreciate that you listened, and hopefully you found it inter interesting. And if you didn't see the video about the content of the Apocalypse of James, then I invite you to go and check that out. And until our next video, I wish you a very good, a very good day.